Nadia Abdallah, welcome to the ITA College Tennis Coaches Podcast. No, thank you so much for having me, Dave. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, Nadia, you're the only returning guest I've ever had. Do you know that? No, I didn't know that. What an honor. (laughs) Well, so coaches should definitely check out. I don't know what number it it is, but uh, it was a couple of years ago and and you did a podcast with with Clarissa Baca, Mm -hmm. who uh, has since retired from college coaching, unfortunately. Hopefully we'll get her back one day, but, uh, but you are a returning champion. So welcome back. Wow. I, I honestly, I do feel honored. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to, um, you know, you haven't been been coaching all that long compared to to some of the guests that, that we've had on the podcast through the years. But was there a particular moment in time, whether uh, during your time as a student athlete uh, or, or after that you really decided this was the career I wanted to go for? I wanted to be a college tennis coach. You know, it didn't it wasn't like that for me. I think as a as a as a student athlete, I I never saw myself as a coach. I I played for Sheila and I was like, oh, she's crazy to be dealing with us. Like who would want to be dealing with student <laughs> athletes? But um, I think as soon when I retired from playing pro tennis and then started working a normal job from uh, nine to five, that's when it hit me that I wanted to be back on the courts. Mm-hmm. And then I started working at a at a tennis academy and I liked it a lot. I, I, I saw that I was a natural helper or a coach. And then I realized very quickly, quickly that I wanted to be at a higher level. And so that's when the opportunity at USD came up. And I think a month in, I was like, this is what I'm meant to be doing. And I really, really fell in love with the job and the mission and, and everything about college tennis. Okay. And so your first role was in college coaching was at USD. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so you ended up being the assistant coach there for, for eight years, which in, yeah. in these days when everybody's instant gratification and moving on to the next thing quickly, you chose to stay there for eight years. Was that intentional because you, you thought, uh, or maybe you had conversations with Sherry that she might be retiring at some point and, and you might be her potential successor or, um, or some other reason? I mean, yes, I think a little bit of that, definitely um, when I was interviewing for the job, you know, Sherry mentioned that she was going to retire at some point and same with the administrator that I interviewed with. So I knew that retirement was coming up. And also I felt that here at USC, it was, we had so much potential. There was a lot of opportunity here that could be developed. And I was very happy to be a part of that challenge or transition. So I think the first two years was just taking care of the culture, getting, making sure that we get the right recruits, get the right, um, the right student athletes with the mindset that we envisioned moving forward. And then I think once that happened, then I was really excited to see kind of like what we could do with a development process. And also obviously as the year went, when the years went on, I started getting a little bit better with recruiting, better with development, better with, a lot of things. So I think one of the main reasons I, I stayed was because I wanted to to see what we could do, not just like, okay, be here for three years and then leave somewhere else and then start over. And that's probably what would have happened if I would have left. So for me, it was not that instant gratification. It was it was complete opposite. It took eight, eight years, mm-hmm. but I think a lot of work was done. And, and I think I was very lucky that Sherry gave me a lot of responsibilities really, really early, you know, and, and I know a lot of assist- assistants don't get that. And I was, I was a privilege to, to get so many, re- so much responsibility because I learned so much. I messed up a lot. I um, did a lot of things right. So I, I was able to learn. So that's one of the reasons why I stayed so long. I just, I felt that this program had a ton of potential that wasn't being developed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we'll, we'll definitely talk about your, your early successes later, later in the podcast, but as you were going through that process to to become Sherry's successor, I know when I moved from being an assistant to head coach, there were some days where I was like, absolutely, I can do this job and here we go and I'm going to get it done. And then other days be like, oh man, maybe I just want to stay as an assistant. Maybe I made the wrong decision here. But did you have any, any doubts uh, when you were kind of making that transition or about to make that transition? And how did you manage those those thoughts? I think yes, a hundred percent. I think anytime you step into a new role, there's always that doubt that, you know, the nervousness, like how am I gonna do? What challenges are gonna come? And but I think it gave me a lot of confidence knowing that 
I was given a lot of responsibility early on. And even like as an assistant, like I, I felt very prepared. So once I got nervous or the doubt came in, like then I was like, Hey, no, I've, I've managed a lot of situations that a lot of people haven't. So I just reminded myself that, that um, it was going to be okay. And if, and if it wasn't, then I have a great support system with my administration or, you know, coaches are my mentors that I can always pick up the phone and, and call. So I felt nervous yet very comfortable and confident that I was ready to step into whatever, you know, role or circumstances were going to happen. Yeah. Good to hear. And, and so, because that, that is a, a transition. I don't think we've talked much on the podcast about it. We've talked about assistant coaches going to be head coaches, but maybe not as much about assistant coach at a program becoming the head coach at the same program. And, and there's, there's, again, there's pros and cons to it, right? You're familiar with the area. You're familiar with the, you already have a relationship with the players, the administration, et cetera. But yeah. that relationship in particular, that, that changes because as the assistant coach, you're often viewed as the, the good cop, the head coach is the bad cop. Everyone loves the assistant and yeah. oh, I wish, I wish the assistant was the head coach kind of thing. But then, then you take on that role and, and now you're trying to maybe manage or reset those boundaries with, with the players that are returning who are like, well, Nadia was the nice one. And now she's telling me I'm not in the lineup and I don't like her as much anymore. Like how, how did you manage that process? How did you think about that process? And, and uh, are you still managing that? I mean, I think it's such, it's such a great point because it is, I think it was a lot easier with the incoming players than with the current players. And we still have a lot of current players. Um, I think we have four players right now that are still, they, they, they were with me as an assistant coach. So it was definitely a transition, but I think something that when I got the job, we had a meeting and one of the things that I always told the girls was like, I'm always going to be honest. Like if it's, if it's, if it comes from me, it's because it's being truthful. It might hurt or it might not hurt. So in the change of roles, it was very clear that I was always going to speak my truth, even if that meant you're not in the lineup, maybe if, or if that meant, Hey, you're not having good practice. You're going to go for a run or whatever that may be. And I think I tried it. I, it was very important for me to communicate with them that it was not personal, you know, and especially I think to something that was maybe a good thing or not was when, when we hired Jordan, he's international. So it took a little bit for him to get the, the visa. So I started at USD um, the first month and a half, I think like with, with take quote unquote without an assistant, but Jordan was around, but it was still kind of like, I think that helped too, because that way I, the girls saw me in my head coaching role, but still kind of like going back and forth. Does that make sense? I know, it makes perfect so, sense. Um, so that was really helpful. But for me, like as soon as I got the job, it was like, no matter what, I'm going to be truthful. And you know, you know me, you know that my intentions are in the right place. And mm -hmm. we just have to do what's best for the team. And, I'm, you know, they knew that I was going to treat them right, that, you know, not always are going to hear what they want. But I think... So far, it's been a very smooth transition. And I think it's also had to do with um, hiring Jordan. Jordan has been such a great asset to our program. Um, since day one, he's been, um, it's been easy. I just, I like working with him, the transition with the girls. So it's like, it's not like a bad cop, good cop or whatnot. It's just speak mm -hmm. the truth. Yeah. And, and sometimes the truth hurts and sometimes the truth is what you want to hear. And that's great, but yeah um, so that's why it's like yeah we go back and forth sometimes he's the bad cop and sometimes i'm like, like so there's no permanent <laughs> cop here it's just what it is and and sometimes and I, again as, as long as the girls know that it comes from a good place i think it's a great place to start and i think right now we are doing a good job communicating that with them with the incoming and the and the returners so you were very intentional with communicating that telling them that this you know preparing them because the, the, I don't think maybe a lot of 18, 19 year olds recognize like, mm -hmm. Oh, Natty is in this, this different role now. And yeah. they just think, you know, it's kind of business as usual, but you were very intentional about communicating that ahead of time and getting them to, to have some awareness about how this transition had, had come about. Yeah. Because I had no idea what I was getting into myself. You know, I was, I had no idea what, 
challenges were going to come up. So I was like, if we all are on the same page and you know that whatever happens, my intentions are in the right place. I do want the best for you and I want the best for the team. Mm -hmm. Then we're on the same page. And, and I think they, the returners knew me well enough that they knew that because also as an assistant coach, I had to play bad cop as well. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't the, the first time that they saw me wearing the bad cop um, <laughs> uh, card. So yeah, yeah. So I think I need even know. It's like, as long as we communicate and they know, and, and we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings, not just team meetings, just to check in. So I think that's how they know, especially at the beginning, that's how they knew kind of like mm -hmm. the this, this situation and how obviously for me, the, pressure was completely different as assistant than, than head coach sure and and well a couple of things on that with with your assistant coach now how have you thought about uh mentoring him or bringing him along lessons that maybe you learned as an assistant coach um that you know maybe there were some gaps in your understanding of what the role was early on in your tenure ha, ha, and and just management of another person as well i mean that's 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 different that's new for you it sounds like it's going really well. But again, how how have you been maybe intentional about that um, that relationship and and managing and mentoring him? I think um, the the toughest part for me has been uh, delegating because I was not used to that. You know, you just mm -hmm. um, you get used to just doing everything yourself, and you don't want to. I don't know. For me, at least, how I am is like I don't want to cause any problems, so I just do it all on my own or ask for help. But with, with Jordan, I think he's someone very similar to me. So I, I think it's been tough delegating, but also at the same time, he's someone that if he sees a problem, he doesn't ask, he just goes and does it. And that has been really good. And, and, and I'm learning to, to delegate still. And, and I think it also comes from trust. Like it didn't happen overnight, but very, very quickly, we, we realized that we're on the same page. We have the same, again, we have the same goals, very similar to the, yeah. the communication I had with my players. And I think with Jordan, something that I'm very grateful to Sherry was, it was that she gave me a ton of responsibility. And obviously that responsibility was, was earned. It was, you know, she, she knew that I was, my intentions wasn't, were in the right place. So, and with Jordan, it's the same thing. So I, I, I wanted him to have a lot of responsibility. So especially now that I'm going on maternity leave, Mm -hmm. she's ready i i'm very calm knowing that i'm going to be yeah. step away for a few weeks months whatever that may be and that he's going to take charge and trust me i can um i mean i don't know if i'm going to be able to sleep at night because i'll have a baby but i'll be very calm you know knowing that he's going to do a great job with the team this next coming yeah. months excellent yeah so in 2020 you completed your master's in leadership studies what what are some of the key learnings from that those studies and and how might you apply them to your role as a head coach yeah i mean that masters i loved it i would recommend it to anyone that has the ability to take this um leadership leadership, leadership studies um masters uh, the biggest takeaway for me is that you get to know yourself um they put us in a lot of human relation classes and you think that you know yours or that you act the way that you act because I don't know I feel everything is so automatic and and this master's kind of like helped me understand why I think the way I think or maybe what image I'm sending to the world so I apply it almost every day because you know as a head coach it's intimidating when you're recruiting it's intimidating when you're having those team uh, meetings it, it could be intimidating for the players to have those one-on-one -on -one meetings so it's like it's very important for us as leaders to be aware of what message we're sending across the table and also um i keep hearing i'm, I'm really tall so I, a lot of recruits are like oh my god i'm so scared of you so it's like okay i know that so how can i make things easier so it's just understanding i think that's the biggest takeaway that i took from my masters is like understanding what people seeing you and also understanding how you really are like without pretending you know I don't know yeah. like your true self and why you think the way you think and if that's something that you have maybe have a blind spot or something that you're missing you can be more aware and and I think especially now in college athletics that that is so important you have to understand you have to connect with people you have to understand others even if you actually don't so mm -hmm. the best way to do it is by getting to know yourself so you can help others so that's my biggest takeaway from the, my leadership studies program okay and if if somebody's listening and they're not able to to attend that, were there any exercises or, or any readings or anything like that that you found helpful that you'd recommend like they they do to maybe understand themselves just that that much better? 
Yeah, there's some conferences. Um, I can I can send them to you later, but there's some human relation conferences. It's only three days. Um, they're only three days long, and it's okay. big group. It's like a big group setting where you talk about very uncomfortable subjects, and it's a small group setting, and they trigger you, and they they kind of like poke you so that you have natural reactions. And then once you have those natural reactions, you get to analyze why you had them. Mm. So it's, uh, I'm sure they're nationwide, but it's human relations, human relations um, seminars. And what you learn in three days, trust me, you're going to take it for the rest of your life. Because again, it's about knowing yourself and, and what really, what image you send to the world and also what things cause you to have a reaction and why. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would definitely recommend that. Okay, very good. Um, so on our last podcast together, we we discussed women in coaching and, yeah. and your work with Latina. Uh, what's the name of the group? Again? Latina Tennis Coach. Latina Tennis yeah. Coach. Um, uh, so it's it's a topic I know you're you're very passionate about. Uh, I, I guess my question is is why 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 have you taken such a keen interest in, in this area and and kind of um, being a champion for for women's coaches, women's tennis coaches in particular? Um, I think it's just 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 the numbers. I think that, you know, obviously over the years, their numbers are, are looking better in, in how many women tennis coaches there's been, especially in, in, in college coaching. I think it's we're making a step in the right direction. It's not where it needs to be yet, but I think we're doing great strides. But for me, it's like when it comes to the the grassroots, like, like younger players, you know, just having more female role models, I think, especially at young ages, not only for girls, but for boys as well. I think it's really, really important. And also um, is there's just a lack of female coaches overall, you know, um, even in the pros. Um, I did the, the WTA um, Women's Pathway. It was incredible uh, to be a part of that. And, and obviously it was it was eye-opening that there's three female coaches in the top 50 WTA in the, in the tour. Like it was, it's crazy. And so for me, you know, I was very lucky to have great female role models growing up. My first coach was a female, my coach, uh, my, while playing in the junior, she was a female as well. And then in college I had a female coach. So I'm probably one of the few that actually had a ton of female, um, coaches and that's probably one of the reasons why I'm here why I'm, why I'm coaching myself I had that representation so that's why I, I'm advocating for that and um, we just need more females overall in, in 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 coaching and especially in our sport yeah and one of the things um, I'd love to chat with you about as well Natty I mean um, it's something we put more attention to here at the ITA but I'll give you give you an example just as we compare the men and, and women, you know, and, and the coaches within our, say, our coaching body within our membership, like a good example is this podcast. If if mm -hmm. I reach out to a, a, a man, whether it's a women's coach or men's coach, doesn't matter, a man, I, I've, I seem to get like straight away. Yes, it's a it's a it's a yes. And when I reached out to you, it was a, it was a yes. But I've had that experience with several women um where they've either chosen no i i, I don't i don't feel confident coming mm -hmm. on the podcast I, I don't feel like i have anything to share or mm -hmm. it's a maybe or a, a reluctant yes um and and i've i've found that in, it's not a scientific yeah. study it's purely yeah. just anecdotal but it's it's how how can we help um uh empower our, our women's yeah. coaches to 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 recognize that they do have as much value as as yeah. anybody else that they should have confidence in in what they have to share and what they can teach and and that they're doing as good a job as anybody else and we need to learn from them as much as we need to learn from from yeah. a man. Um, do you do you have any thoughts on why that is? How we can address that? Um, and That's any so other interesting, Dave. That's crazy. Uh, That's so interesting what you're saying. Um, yeah. I think what the initiative that the IT that the ITA is doing with ITAW with Lauren, I think that's an incredible initiative. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's a it was a three day seminar, right? Like, is it over? It was well, it was three separate days over the course yeah. of January. But now uh, Lauren's running the women's coaches group that Daniel uh, Daniel McNamara started mm -hmm. last year. So just trying to keep that continuity, keep coaches coming yeah. together while 
implementing some learning opportunities as well. I mean, I think that's that's an incredible first step. And I think going back to the previous question, I think females, if we if female coaches, like if if we keep if we keep that circle, if because for me, I think that I am confident because I have a great support system and Sheila McInerney. Anything that goes wrong, I just call Sheila and it's like, what will you do? So and that has given me a ton of confidence. So I think that if we have that mentorship program, we us coaches, we stay together and actually want to help each other and actually want to um, be there for one another. I think it's going to help those that are not very confident or those that, you know, that might actually need the help or might need, you know, um, the experience to get to get where the confidence might might um, start getting there. So I think it's just being there for one another, keep creating these mentorship programs and and even like creating a WhatsApp group for just female coaches, college coaches that, you know, whenever something comes up or I can, like, I can, if we had a group, I could be like, Hey, next time Dave asks for a podcast, like <laughs> just do it. You know, if you have questions, call me or call someone else and we'll hype yeah. you up. So yeah. I think that could be very beneficial. Just being in touch all of us and, and actually meaning to do well by one another and, and, and keep motivating each other to do great things. Yeah, well, thank you for being a, a role model in that area. And, and no doubt that uh, hopefully younger female coaches listening to this, um, you know, recognize that uh, we all need to step up and serve in different ways. And and uh, there's different ways that you can do that. But don't uh, don't believe for a second that you don't have uh, the ability to add value to to uh, the other you know journeys that coaches are on so um 100%. thank you for saying yes to this so for a second time um so since taking over as the head coach at usd you like we talked about you really taking that team to the next level you made the ita team indoor championships last year which is is uh really challenging to do uh, it's, it's yeah. a tough place to get to i was just back from seattle the level out there was just incredible last weekend um this year you've already had some big top 10 top 25 wins so what influence do you believe you had on the players on the program um that is allowing them now to compete at this level on a consistent basis i think it was a lot of your years of work to be honest we we did, definitely did before i started as head coach we did like the groundwork like the foundation was was there i think that um, a lot of people are surprised that, you know, we're this, like that we've been having the results that we're having and obviously this season's not over and anything can happen. So um, I'm very aware of that, but I feel that it was years in the making. It was, it was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of recruiting the right people into, into our school. And, and I think that while doing that, and then the addition of Jordan, because Jordan is someone, when he came in, he has this confidence about himself. Like he's very confident. And I think he was able to inject that confidence and 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 I don't want to say arrogance, because it's not arrogance. It's like self-esteem into the girls. And um and so we we were we did the like before I started head coach, the groundwork was there. Then Jordan came in and and he put that sense of confidence into the team. And then a lot of things just clicked, you know, we've done a great job developing our, our girls during practice, during tournaments. And maybe that was something that was lacking in the past. And, and even last year, you know, we had great wins, but also we didn't have great, we had some not so good losses. So our goal this year is to have the great wins, but also maintain and stay that, keep that focus when it comes to the whole season, not just, you know, peak here and then go down. And so that's that's our goal right now, but I, I feel that the success is no surprise. We've done we put in we we've put on the work years ago, and at the same time we put in the work every single day. So I think it's it, I'm happy that it's paying off for the girls because they're working really hard, and and I think that finally they're they're getting that confidence and understanding like hey we're we're as good as anyone in the nation, and and let's take them down no matter what jersey we're playing against. So it's it's been really cool and. And again, again, I think our biggest thing moving forward is keeping that hunger and that consistency, which mm -hmm. is going to define how good we're going to be this year. Very good. And then moving forward, Nadia, just in terms of recruiting, obviously college athletics going through this monumental change and, and um, you know, everything now that, that 
power four conferences once the pac 12 goes away um you know all these things that that these schools are able to offer versus division one mid-major programs at, at conferences that aren't part of kind of all the discussions mm -hmm. that are happening right now i mean are you getting questions from recruits about nil you know opportunities and and how much money they're going to get above their scholarship from from various different sources that are legal through the nca now yeah. but are, are you starting to see a shift in some of these things is it getting harder for you to to compete in that recruiting arena yes yes um it's been really hard it's been really hard because you know obviously as a mid-major we don't have the same resources as the power fours or power fives but um, I think it's an opportunity for us to get creative and and it is really tough, but at the same time, we just have to be very aware of who our niche is in terms of recruiting. You know, maybe before it was our niche, like our it was like the the pool was a lot bigger than it it is now because I feel now the first three questions are what are you going to give me with NILs? Then USD is not the school for this. For these recruits we're not if they right. look for for that then we're not for them and, and at least we're not wasting our time and they're not wasting their time mm -hmm. but if those questions come along later in the process then we can work with that and we can find solutions but for sure um, as a mid-major it is it is concerning it is um, a big problem especially for us this year recruiting has been really really difficult but there's mm -hmm. always players that they buy into the program they buy into the value and they buy i mean you know, we know what we're, what we're worth. We know what the University of San Diego women's tennis team offers. And we want to find those players that see that. And not everybody's going to see that, and that's okay. But um, just finding ways and finding the right people, which is now it's a lot more challenging, but yeah. it is what it is. It's either you, you make the change or you just fall behind. So we just have to get creative. Right. And so with that, so if, if a recruit comes right out the gates and, and asks those questions, Will you just cross them off your list and just not waste any more time? Or will you continue to kind of, you know, convince that, no. hey, the work? no, you'll just move no. on? I think if it's if it's like if it's in the first three questions, then I think it's not the right fit. OK, because if that's our priority, it's it's not who we are. Yeah. You know, it's not yeah. what we're for. So they can go somewhere else. And that's OK, too. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. and then the funny thing is once you say no, then they want to know more. So it's, it's, it's interesting, <laughs> um, but it's, it's with the situation we're in. No, but that takes some discipline to do that yeah. and, and to move on and, and focus on those that you think are, are going to be a better fit and more likely to commit at a later date. So yeah, well done on having that discipline. <laughs> um, all right, Thank we're going to move into some rapid fire. What's the most influential book on your coaching career to date? Um, I think it's been Outliers. Mm. You read it? I have. Yeah. Yeah. What, I, what aspect of that book has been so? Um, I mean, I think it's the the 10,000 hour rule. Yeah. You know, and so it's like when we're like, that's why like we're successful because we've done that. You know, it's like I have that in mind. It's like we put in the work, we've put in everything. So there's no reason why we're not going to be successful and we're doing things the right way. So I just a lot of things that happen. I just go back to the book or this is this has nothing to do with what I actually do. But like even like remember the part where they he says that the best athletes are born January through March. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. not, not that I'm recruiting I'm like when was she born? Because we have a ton of great players yeah. that are born in October and November. But I'm always like curious to see. And so anyway, so that book, I think just. Yeah. Oh, all his books know. are great. Yeah. Huh? All Malcolm Gladwell's books are are yeah. fantastic reads. So yeah, yeah, Blink is good too. Yeah, so I just I I love that type of those types of books and and but Outliers for me is 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 the one. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite drill you like to do with your team? Yes. Recently, um, we we made we made up a a drill called Plus One, mm -hmm. and basically we have two coaches standing on one side in kind of like doubles formation, one up, one back. Mm -hmm. And we have the girls line up and uh, I feed either a um, really easy volley or a really easy overhead. If they put that ball away and it goes like it goes untouched, it's plus one. If the coaches touch the ball and miss, it's a zero. 
And if the, to the coaches actually make that shot is minus one and the goal is to get to 10. So it's kind of like discipline number one and number two is put the ball away. You okay. get there where you work the point so hard, put it away, you know? So at first it was, we thought it was going to be a lot quicker than it was. And now it's getting better. But I think right now that's my favorite drill, the plus one drill. Right. Very good. Yeah. I remember the frustrations as a coach uh, <laughs> when they wouldn't put the ball away. Put it away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Should NCA singles and doubles championships be in the fall or the spring? Oh, I'm a big old spring. Um, I think because I think it gives you a lot more time as a singles and doubles team to or players to actually prove yourself and develop yourself. There's less rush to prove yourself. And then also, I think from a coaching's perspective, it. I think players are going to put more pressure to deliver results in the fall and then the fall like the development part of it scares me so when are we going to put in the time into development while also competing so mm. that's my worry so okay. I, that's my spring for me okay interesting <laughs> i've always i guess my belief has always been especially in college at least uh, again yeah. personally speaking i got better from competing yeah i don't feel like i i you know practice yeah, none fine I really like practice. I just love competing. So I got better from matches. But look, this is great. This is why we're going to find out. We've had this conversation for even before I was, you know, a, yeah. a coach when I was in college. Should it be in the fall? Should it be in the spring? So we're going to find out these next two years and go from there. So do you, uh, if there was one rule change that should be implemented next season, what should it be? That's a great question. Um, a rule change. I think maybe the medical timeout, sometimes they're very, they're asked for in a convenient timing. So being more strict about it. And if mm -hmm. I think there should be a lot a more, it, there should be more strictness on medical timeouts. Okay. Well, yeah. every year the ITA puts out a survey to coaches as to yeah. what rule changes the rule committee should, should, uh, should consider so coaches yeah. if you're listening to this and you get that survey please put in ideas there because the rules committee works really hard to to um to figure out what changes should be made on an annual basis um one word that describes your coaching style um i think it's gonna sound weird but i think it's individualistic um i truly i treat my players as individuals so I'm not going to coach one player the same way that I co coach the next so I think that will be one word to describe me good and uh best piece of advice you've ever received doesn't have to be tennis related trust your gut you know you know you know what you feel so just trust it okay well yeah. Nadia we did it thank you so much that was great thank you Dave thank, thank you so much for having me okay and good luck with uh your upcoming uh big day and becoming a mother so it's exciting probably Founded. by the time this podcast goes out you will now have been become a mother so congratulations <laughs> thank you crazy <laughs> <laughs>